round table of year two of our um, deindustrialization, the politics of our time project, we call it Depot, which you know, less less wordy. And the, the theme for this year's uh, series of roundtables is rethinking uh, the field of deindustrialization studies. And so we're expanding the, ge the geography, like the field has been very much sort of, I think it comes out of mainly like the United States that sort of expanded to sort of the old, you know, industrialized world of Western Europe and North America. And, uh, and of course, you know, there's more and more um, scholarship and more and more need to really to really expand sort of north south and think about how how these changes have unfolded in other corners of the world um, and so this is what we'll be exploring um, this term we're also having a, a session dedicated uh, focusing on gender and this is also something that um, you know the field has been very much sort of anchored in sort of classic male proletarian industries like steel and auto. Um, and, and so what happens when we shift that focus, right, to, to industries that were considered more peripheral or more disposable that employed uh, mainly, mainly women, for example, and how does it change when we, when we look at these issues through a gender lens? Um, Actually, Lauren Laframboise, who's the main staffer for the project, just finished her master's thesis on women in the textile industry, an awesome thesis. Uh, so congratulations, Lauren. Um, and so there's a, there's a lot of good work that, that's coming up right now um, among a new generation of scholars in the field. I think we'll really you know, revisit some of the assumptions that have been made over the past, you know, past 20 years. So we open, we open the series uh, with Australia. And, and one of the, the challenges for us, you know, North Americans who are used to, you know, <laughs> uh, controlling time maybe a bit more um, is, is that when we, when we go more global, we have to deal with time zones, right? And so when we organized this, this, uh, this panel, we had to think about Europe um, or that time zone uh, the Americas and Australia, and so we came up with a time that works very well, I think, for Europe and um, and Australia, uh, less well for North Americans. Although uh, I just want to thank all the North Americans that are out there for for being here, like you know, solidarity, um, and um, and I think it's going to be really really a great session. Uh, I'm particularly excited about about this session in part because um, well, it's co-sponsored by two really fantastic um, uh, projects that are uh, funded by the Australian Research Council. And I'm a very small peripheral, tiny part of both of them, <laughs> like more virtually part of them because of the pandemic and so on. Uh, but the first is, is called uh, History, Heritage and Environmental Change in a Deindustrialized Landscape. And it's headed by uh, Tanya Evans uh, from Macquarie. University in, in Sydney, and we'll hear we'll hear about that project. Uh, the, the first two presenters will be, uh, will be focusing on that, and the other is continuity and change in the Australian industrial landscape, uh, headed by Chris Gibson uh, at the University of Wollongong. That's how you pronounce it. I, I, I've, I've never actually had to say it out loud, so I hopefully I hope I'm right. Um, it's Woll Wollongong, as in as in wool. Oh, wool and gone. Okay, thank you. No, see, I it's, it's not spelled things, that way, but you have to shift yeah, to yeah. The reality. <laughs> As an oral historian, I understand this. <laughs> it's a different language when you translate. Anyway, um, and uh, Chris and and Chantal will be presenting, I think, mostly on that project. Um, although I don't know what they're presenting on precisely. Lucy's part of both projects, so I don't know how she'll split herself into two. Um, but we also have uh, two, two other fantastic scholars who've been doing, uh, I think, really important work on, on deindustrialization. Uh, Jesse Adam Stein, who, who, who comes out of design, I believe, has been really thinking about, you know, uh, skills and deindustrialization and what happens in this transformation and this other kind of sort of, you know, uh, knowledge, right, that gets lost or gained. And I think this is a, a dimension too that I think has been not really explored enough in the field. And I think, I think Jess is doing really, really important work uh, on this. 
And then, of course, Eric Eklund, who, who I think most of us have, have known his work for many years. And, and I know he's worked with, um, with uh, uh, Stefan Berger in Germany for different things. I think you have. <laughs> My understanding is you have. Um, um, and uh, anyway, so I think we're going to have a really great round table. Today. So the, the logistics uh, for the session and, and Seamus O'Hanlon, who's the other person on the program, uh, unfortunately could not uh, be here today. He had a bicycle accident. And so, and so we have one fewer person uh, than we had planned, but six people is already plenty. And so, and so I think we'll have a full, you know, a full program. Uh, logistics, you know, the idea of these roundtables is that they're short presentations that allow us to have more time for, for conversation and to sort of think about the links you know, between the different presenters and maybe to think more globally around, you know, uh, what, you know, not just like what's happening in Australia, but what that means perhaps to the wider conversations around deindustrialization. Like what can the study of, of Australia's experience contribute to this more, you know, this global conversation that we're trying to have. And, and so I'm very, <clears throat> you know, interested and curious about, about what we'll come up with there. And then the questions will be, uh, will be at the end and you can either, um, you know, uh, ask them live, right? Just to show your video so I, I see you. And, um, uh, or you can ask the question in chat and I'll, I'll try to follow up. So that's the program and that was a bit long-winded, but a bit longer than normal. <laughs> I'm still waking up, so I'm probably rambling. Um, but, uh, but welcome everyone. And, uh, and I'm glad to see, see you folks here. Uh, so we're gonna start with, uh, with Tanya and Lucy, and I'm just gonna pull up their bios. Cause I'm on the road, I don't, uh, I didn't have paper. And so I normally have this off screen. Okay, so Tanya, uh, Evans is director of the Center for Applied History at Macquarie University in Sydney. Her books include Family History, Historical Consciousness and Citizenship, uh, was published in, well, will be published in 2022, and Making Histories with Paula Ashton and Paula Hamilton as co-editors. Uh, I, I know Paula well, you know, really great, uh, great oral and public historian. Uh, she curates ex exhibitions and works as a consultant for TV production companies making historical documentaries. Lucy Taxa, uh, who I've known for many years uh, and has been, um, yeah, I, I've really enjoyed collaborating with for many years, is director of uh, Macquarie University Center for Work Workforce Futures. Uh, she had been a consultant historian on a range of heritage studies and contributed to several oral history projects and historical exhibitions. She was secretary, vice president, and president of the Australian Society for the Study of Labor History. She has published on working life and management. And these are the short bios. I could have actually gone on and on, of course. So uh, over to you, uh, Tanya and, and Lucy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much um, for inviting us and for being part of your session. Um, I am an early bird, not an ITA, so I'd much rather speak at 6 a.m. than 8 p.m., but um, I may have to lean on my lovely partner, Lucy Taxer, who is undoubtedly more energetic in the evening. Um, but it's wonderful to be here uh, to talk about this project um, that we began working on really at the start of this year. So. Um, are in the rugged Jameson uh, and Megalong Valleys in the beautiful Blue Mountains in New South Wales here in Australia, lie um, the, the ne neglected remains of two shale mining villages. And our project is focused on that. And this is, we've given you a map so that you can have some idea of where the Blue Mountains are, because some of you may not know where on earth we're talking about. And this is what it looks like. Um, it's a gorgeous space. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the contested histories of this space um, this evening. And we were very fortunate um, to get ARC funding to work on this project. Um, and it is a truly kind of collaborative and multidisciplinary project focused upon these sites in the Blue Mountains. That's combining a range of evidence and methods in order to provide new insights into everyday working life, family life, gender, transiency and migration. Um, and uh, 
it's this work is really timely because of the recent bushfires that ripped through the area, which means that these sites have been um, uh, uh, bared for us to work on and our archaeologists have been busy doing site surveys of the work this year in these kind of pockets of possible research during this COVID year. Um, and we haven't undertaken anywhere like the amount of work we had hoped to undertake by now, but we have had a brilliant uh, research assistant working on the project, Dr. Anne Coote, who has been, and she's a local to the Blue Mountains and we have discovered the joy of having locals involved in this project. Um, Anne has been busy undertaking archival research, particularly newspaper research, um, and also what we understand to be as a kind of methodological innovation of this project, um, combining family, local and community history, especially genealogical techniques to unearth um, the marginalized histories of this space, these marginalized histories of working class families, of women, of migrants, uh, many of whom had traveled mostly from England. There are some continental European names amongst the miners who settled in the mountains, um, but we're trying to unearth um, these lives in order to understand more about colonial Australia, about um, global work, migrant cultures and much else besides. Um, and we really want to um, unearth this, this, this sort of forgotten history that we're going to be talking about um, tonight. Um, and these are a range of the methods and sources that we'll be using um, throughout the project. Um, and I'm turning across to Lucy now, who will tell you something about the mining industry. Thanks. Thanks, um, uh, Tanya. And thanks uh, for this great uh, opportunity for us to all have a conversation. So look, uh, this timeline, which I want to thank Anne for putting together, uh, is, a, is basically an attempt to locate the shale mining industry in um, the Blue Mountains in time and in space. Uh, to highlight that there was actually a very close relationship between coal mining and shale mining in this um, early period uh, in the 19th century. But as you can see, the coal mining uh, that preceded shale mining uh, also continues to this day, of course, uh, in uh, the areas that are north of the Blue Mountains, Newcastle, Hunter area, South Illawarra and uh, around the Port Kembla area that was mentioned before. Um, and uh, basically also west of where the Blue Mountains is in the Lithgow area where there were also some shale mines. And um, basically what you can see is that the shale mining actually had a very short lifespan mainly uh, because of limited resources and depletion, but not only because of that. And we're starting to think about the competing um, uh, energy sources and technologies and, and the way uh, electricity um, powered by uh, coal um, superseded kerosene uh, for gas lighting. Um, the, the sort of timeline actually shows that uh, the oil uh, shale deposits were first found in a place called Joadja and also uh, near Port Kembla, uh, yeah, Mount Kembla actually, during the 1860s. Um, but it actually wasn't until 1878 that uh, a coal mine was established near South Katoomba in the Blue Mountains. And that was um, run by a particular company called the Katoomba Coal and Shale Mine. Uh, and they set up their first shale mine at Ruined Castle in the Jamison Valley in 1887. A few years later, they were taken over by another company that uh, took over that mine, the coal mine in Katoomba, and also then set up a, a constructed a tram line, which I'll show you in a moment, and a tunnel uh, that enabled a mine to be set up at another place called Nellie's Glen. And so what we're really looking at in this area are three mines. Um, but what, what this next slide is, this is just a first rough draft attempt by us to uh, explore the relationship between the different mines, the different owners of the mines, uh, the um, operations 
uh, and the situations, um, and as I'll point out, the, the tension between mining and, and tourism. Um, the green denotes the companies involved, the purple denotes the closures of the mines, um, which actually illustrates how precarious the, the shale mining was there. And the red den den um, denotes the strike activity um, undertaken by the workers. And just as an aside, it seems that there was far more mobilization by coal miners than there were of shale miners. And I can maybe talk about that and Anne can talk about it as well in the discussion later on. The key point here is that it was very precarious, uh, a very precarious life for the miners. Um, and their, their numbers weren't great. I mean, just to give you an example, at the ruined Castle mine in 1893, there were 95 men working there and that dropped off to 50 a few years later. And then the mine closed and then it was open again and so on. But essentially the conditions in the mines that we're starting to uncover were terrible, uh, as were the living conditions nearby, ranging from tents to huts to, to rudimentary boarding houses. And Tanya will say a little bit more about that. And what we've also found is a, a high level of alcoholism and sly grog and so on and so forth. But Essentially, what's interesting is that the initial promise of this mining industry with the coming of the railway, the railway's need for shale, and also demands from Germany, it, it looked like this was going to be uh, a very viable activity. But if you look at that, it, can you go back uh, one slide for a moment, um, Tanya? If you look uh, at, you'll see that there's um, two hotels um, in white listed there. And basically what it illustrates is that tourism coincides with the start of the mining. And unlike the mining, it continues to grow so that by the time the mines are closed in 1904, um, tourism has grown uh, quite exponentially. So uh, that's something that Tanya will talk about. Um, thanks. But the key, key points that um, I wanted to end on in my section was to say, look, um, we really think that erasure is a, a useful um, way to look at uh, what's happened to the shale mining industry um, in this area. Um, this dominance of tourism uh, has had a huge impact on the landscape and on memory. And the de demise of the mining industry and the deindustrialization of the locality, despite remaining physical remnants that the archaeologists have found, has definitely ensured that all of the industry and the working people uh, along with it have been enveloped in silence, to quote Stephen. Um, on the slide, basically, I uh, just wanted to suggest that the, this erasure has resulted from the competition between mining and tourism and the victory of tourism in the early 20th century and the continuing ruination of the mining sites and their return to nature because of where they are. So um, in such a, a difficult terrain, if you like, and um, I really like the idea that it's the victory not only of tourism, but this notion of the sublime, the appreciation of these natural scenes. And so this context of tourism and depoliticised representations of the landscape um, have erased the vestiges of industry, the, the men, the miners, the women, as well as the um, original inhabitants uh, the Gundagang, Gundangara and Darug uh, Aboriginal people that lived alongside the miners um, as well. And I think that the key point is if you contrast the, the photos of the industry uh, and these, these uh, posters that, um, that Tanya is showing at the moment, you can see that, that you know, industry is that that trope of industry is ugly and dirty and here tourism is so colourful and attractive and so on. 
So Tanya, do you want to take over? I think we're running out of time. So I think uh, I'm going to, if I get a nod, I'm going to kind of wrap up in a couple of minutes here. And I think uh, Lucy's made this point really well. And what we're hoping to do with the kind of research that we're doing is to piece together the life stories of the people who lived there, albeit for a short space of time, who often moved on. And what we have discovered, and this speaks to um, some of the points you were suggesting about your focus upon gender, Stephen, and, and this is you know, something that I'm really interested in with regards to my research. It's piecing together the intimate lives of men and women in this space. Um, and um, the lives of women who are working as oyster sellers, washerwomen for the local guest houses, as the as a nascent tourism starts to take shape in the area, um, and uh, they're taking in boarders, as Lucy suggests, um, and often sometimes working um, in uh, tandem with the local Aboriginal community. And this is, of course, another history that has been erased, as Lucy's talked about. Uh, so we have we are really looking forward to piecing together these histories. And uh, learning why their lives um, have not been remembered in particular ways and doing their lives justice with our project and hoping to get locals um, and um, when tourists come back to the Blue Mountains and the community has been, you know, they do usually have a very sizable um, international tourist market, lots of uh, Americans, for example, they really want locals people across New South Wales to engage with the history of this area. And it seems to us, uh, members of the project, that this is a really rich project to get people to completely rethink um, this space um, in, in the future. Thank you. Well, thank, thank thanks so thank much, uh, Tanya and, and Lucy. That, that was great. And I think your presentation, um, your combined presentation really raises all kinds of questions, right? Like, one is time. Often in the field, we tend to focus on the 1970s, 80s, 90s. Um, and there is an, you know, a scholarship that looks earlier, but, but I think yours is a reminder that we see um, you know, there's layers in, in the landscape. There's, there's, there's layers of erasure, I guess. Like, um, and and I'm, I'm really curious about how archeology span can really uh, contribute to these water discussions, right? Where, where we don't have you know, textual records or even perhaps um, <clears throat> oral histories in the same way, right? And so I, I, think, I think this work is really interesting. And, and from a Canadian perspective, I um, you immediately think about like settler colonialism and how, how industrialism is bound up in settler colonialism. So how do we think about that, right? <laughs> when we talk about deindustrialization and, and the tendency of sort of, um, you know, locating to, to sort of, on, you know, we want to honor working class people, right? But how do we do that while still acknowledging these other power relationships, right? And so it's, it's a difficult, but very, very important kind of work that you're doing. So, so thank you so much. Um, ne next up, we have, uh, we have Chris Gibson. I was gonna pull up your, your bio. Um, so Chris is uh, a professor of human geography at the University of Wollongong and project lead on, on the um, Australian Research uh, Council project I mentioned earlier, Continuity and Change in the Australian Industrial Landscape. And, um, and so I, I don't know Chris well, but I've started to work with him a little bit on this new project and I'm really excited to, to, to make this connection. And, and I think Chris brings a lot to, to the field. And, uh, and so Chris, go for it. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. And I'm just gonna share screen and let's see if we can get the technology to work. There we go. All right, I think we're in business. Uh, wonderful. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you, Lauren, um, for the opportunity to participate in this panel and, and all the work leading up to its organizing as well. So yeah, look, I'm in here in lockdown on Gadigal Aboriginal country um, in the Eora Nation, um, here in what um, we also call Sydney. Uh, but I'm also talking today um, to this topic from a place called Port Kembla which is a site of many freshwater and saltwater Darawal creation stories. And it remains unceded Aboriginal country, subject to First Nations sovereignty for traditional owners who we wish to acknowledge today. 
Um, I just realized following from Tanya and Lucy, the historians who had a great map to let you know where you are, that I should have put a map here to let everybody know where Port Kembla is. And I'm the geographer. So you've got to trust the geographer to forget to put a map in their presentation. So I wish I could give you a map to help orientate people who are not familiar with this part of the world. Um, but Port Kembla is, 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 uh, is part of a bigger city called Wollongong, um, which is about an hour and a half um, drive south of Sydney, just to uh, orientate yourself on the east coast of Australia. So um, a bunch of us at the University of Wollongong, uh, myself, Chantel Carr, Andrew Warren, um, are members of a research team that also includes Lucy Tuxa, who you just recently heard from, um, as well as Stephen from Concordia, um, and Amelia Hine, who's here with us with her camera off at the moment, I think, lurking in the background as part of the, um, as part of the audience, and Jen Macy as well, who have joined the team as newly recruited postdoctoral and postgraduate researchers. Together, we're, we're commencing an ARC-funded project um, on continuity and change in the industrial lang landscape, focusing on this place, Port Kembla. Regional industrial ports, such as this, are key sites connecting Australia with international trade and infrastructure networks. Profound economic, technical, and social change since the 1980s have compelled industrial port regions to adapt to emergent and unprecedented changes in both commodity and capital flows. Existing capacities, underpin new opportunities for regions that originally prospered from 20th century industrial expansion. Yet competing land use pressures and macroeconomic transformations increasingly pose threats to urban industrial space, urban industrial old factories and industrial zoned land. And following recent privatizations of ports and regulatory complications surrounding them, growing debate engulfs the future of Australian port infrastructure. What remains disputable is that change in industrial port regions intersects with complex structures, spaces, and histories. An increased awareness of the social and cultural values of industrial heritage, for example, offers an, op offers an opportunity to bring together past legacies, present capacities, and future opportunities to inform new cycles of economic and social development and community renewal. Pursuing urban renewal and port-related regional development strategies without a socio-cultural evidence base risks neglecting important legacies that have shaped industrial regions and that may be key to their future resilience. So in this context, our, the new project, which has just started, um, seeks to gather and analyze evidence from the past and the present that can inform the future development of industrial port landscapes in ways that recognize value and build on these existing social and physical infrastructures. There has been a lot of change since the Hoskins Iron and Steel Company first established a steelworks in the locality in 1927, after substantial coal reserves were discovered nearby. And here I'm very much referring to Eric Eklund, who's another of the panelists here today, who wrote the book on the history of Port Kembla um, and a revised version of that as well. So I'm very much beholden to Eric and all of the work that he's done on this in the, in, in, uh, previously. Known throughout the 20th century as Australian Island Steel and later as BHP Limited, Port Kembla Steelworks remains operational today as Blue Scope Steel, though with a significantly reduced workforce since, ex since its expansion in the 1950s and 60s, underpinned by government-sponsored mass migration, especially from Southern Europe. By 1975, workers from 68 different countries labored at Port Kembla in the steelworks. Since its peak, however, unemployment linked to the steelworks restructuring has worsened. First in the early 1980s, when some 14,000 workers lost their jobs, again in the 1990s, and again in 2011, when a further 1,000 jobs were cut as steel exports ceased. Meanwhile, in nearby Unandera, 300 jobs were also lost in textiles, uh, in factories which produced iconic Bonds singlets and King G workwear. So there is a gendered aspect here, here too, um, an industry predominantly employing women, textiles, less making the headlines around job losses. Uh, but when they do, as you can see here with a front page of the Illawarra Mercury, the local newspaper being cast in a certain kind of masculine light. So I'm just interesting that kind of resonance with uh, what both Lucy uh, and Lucy referring to Stephen's work before we're talking about in terms of erasures and silences. Um, here's a, I think a distinctive gendered skew on that where the, the main narrative has been very much around job losses at the steelworks 
Uh, but in an in industry, for example, predominantly employing women, there have been um, you know parallel processes of restructuring, offshoring, and, and job loss as well, but less kind of part of that 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 big narrative of the place. Since the 1980s, um, we've also seen uh, amidst those silences other un what a might might many might consider unwelcome presences. Um, so Port Kembler has been intensively spotlighted as a troubled place with empty shops and street sex work on the community's main street, Wentworth Street, blamed for growing place stigma. Successive revitalization strategies have been rolled out, mobilizing global scripts of gentrification and the creative class. Often assumed to be deindustrializing and in decline, activity at Port Kembler has diversified, expanding its reach and influence. So it's important here, I think, to remain critical about discourses of deindustrialization and the way in which they travel across place and are made sense of and cohere or are dissonant with local experience. So in Port Kembla, for example, with deep water access, well-developed infrastructure networks, um, it is the largest single industrial site in Australia and a skilled local workforce, as well as proximity to Sydney, it remains a pivotal industrial setting for the nation. So not, not, notwithstanding the, the huge job loss and substantive labour market change that we've observed since the 1980s, this is still an industrial place. So northern discourses of deindustrialization and, and ruination, they do reverberate here and are often mobilised or touched upon as a way of making sense of change in Port Kembla, but they don't neatly map onto physical change in the urban landscape and the industrial landscape and continuity, nor necessarily with lived experience. So while the continuity of steelmaking anchors the locality, emergent co commodity and capital flows have reconfigured the landscape. So it's no longer simply a steel town. The new commodities flow through its infrastructure in growing volumes. Beyond high-grade metallurgical coal exports, Port Kembla now hosts a major cement production facility, the nation's biggest motor vehicle import hub, and the largest bulk grain export facility in New South Wales. And you can see here also a photo of um, wind turbines that are being imported into Australia um, to be uh, constructed on wind farms. So there's an interesting kind of like irony around all of that um, as these different commodities and materials and goods are coming in and out of a port like this. So it means that the emergence and expansion of new commodity forms and flows for residents and workers, it means that they've intimately borne witness to the extraordinary socio material transformations of late modernity. Cars, grain, cement, steel, and coal are emblematic commodities of this period in history, and their various trajectories demonstrate an Australian industrial economy in transition. And in the most recent iteration of this, I've only got one more, a couple more slides and I'm done. Um, the most recent iteration of this um, ent entails mining magnate Andrew Twiggy Forrest and his plans to build and operate a hydrogen power station at Port Kembla which is at present being actively discussed as part of a green energy transition, spurring new industrial investment in car and, and truck manufacture and so-called green steel. Though there's a whole lot of questions around the degree of investment that's planned around this and the number of ongoing jobs that might be there for local people as a consequence of, of this, this sort of um, activity um, happening. So in the midst of these wider forces and big plans, we are interested in the lived experiences of this place. Those of working people, migrant communities, experiences of redundancy and re-employment, especially since in more recent times, since the 1980s restructuring, but especially amidst more recent rounds of industrial change. And especially following those commodities and thinking through their settler colonial tentacles. Andrew Warren's work on the team has um, has Andrew has been working with um, steel workers that have been made redundant, has been questioning the deindustrialization script, pointing instead to increased productivity at Port Kembla Steelworks, even amidst falling numbers of permanent employees, and instead um, bringing to light a set of critical questions around the wide, widespread restructuring of its labor politics, with growing use of subcontracting, declines in union membership, and longer commutes to and from work in this place. There are fewer quality jobs, though they do exist. Port Kembla not only remains an industrial place, in fact, it's being fortified. As became her headline news when on the 5th of April, 2020, the cruise ship Ruby Princess moored at Port Kembla after earlier disembarking passages at Sydney's Circular Quay, right in the heart of Sydney, uh, and spawning the country's first major wave of COVID-19 infections. 
The pandemic has since amplified the militarized governance of this industrial support port space with growing use of surveillance technologies and security and health subcontractors, fiercer gates and fences, stricter entry points and biosecurity protocols. For maritime unions and neighboring communities, such trends physically and symbolically sever access to and from port spaces with amongst other things, implications for industrial organizing. But of course, beyond the electric fences are adjacent communities, their homes and families of port workers, uh, local Aboriginal people for whom this remains country and remains significant um, place of creation stories um, and ordinary prosaic workplaces. And the view from here reveals an industrial capacity that is not monolithic. At Port Kembla, the steel and coal industries continue to operate, but also evident in new enterprises, many connected to the university founded on strong industrial links. So often overlooked in economic debates around manufacturing futures, around deindustrialization and the diverse cultures that industrial regions and enterprises foster. At the height of the first pandemic wave, for example, the region's skilled industrial workers and engineers mobilized to manufacture PPE for which supply chains were severely disrupted for frontline health workers, while union delegates and volunteers from the local seafarers mission marshaled resources and delivered thousands of care packages to the workers stranded on the Ruby Princess cruise ship while it was undergoing all of the biosecurity interrogation, the police investigations and so forth. So local res localized resilience and cultures of camaraderie and experimenting with materials are deeply entwined with regional industrial capacity, a vital asset we think when contemplating more volatile futures. And on that note, that's enough for me. And I believe up next is Chantelle who will give you a much more of a fine grained look at a very um, particular piece of the story that unfolds. Thanks so much, Chris. That, that was great and really raises some, I think, really interesting issues. And on the one hand, I'm thinking about like how these flows, emerging flows of commodity and capital, you know, of course, through port cities, right, and the whole restructuring of, um, of that, you know, that, that's a, such a transnational story and how it plays out in different places. I also really appreciate, you know, the, the point that you're making around, you know, how the discourse of, of sort of industrial decline can actually erase or occlude, you know, persistent industrialization. And I think this is something that, that Jackie Clark has talked about in the French context where she talks about sort of visibility and invisibility and, and how that's a political process as much as anything else or even Kathy Stanton's work um, uh, where, where she's really talking about how we have to go beyond sort of this bookend kind of idea, right? Where, where we're just moving from one era to another when in fact there's much more complexity on the ground. So this is, this is great stuff that really, really again connects, uh, connects well with, uh, with what's, what we've been talking about within the project in a European or, or North American context. So as Chris mentioned, next up we have Chantelle. And this is that your bio. Um, so Chantelle uh, is an ARC DECRA fellow, I believe, at, at the University of Wollongong. Uh, her research examines the capacities of workers and households to negotiate change in energy intensive sectors and regions. Her empirical focus is on industries such as steel making, coal, and the built environment at the heart of the carbon economy in Australia. Uh, and uh, I'm only starting to get to know Chantelle as well. And I'm really excited by, by the kind of work she does. And I think it's really, really inspiring. So Chantelle. You might have to unmute yourself. Thanks, Stephen. I managed to uh, share my screen before I unmuted myself. I was thinking, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. Um, okay, let me see how I go here. I always do this thing where I have other the people off to the side. Oh well, let's run with it. Um, thanks, Stephen, and uh, thanks, Lauren, and all of your colleagues for hosting the Australian contingent tonight. I think most of us, lots of us know each other, um, but not, not all of us, so it's really nice to, to meet up. Um, I'm coming to you tonight from the unceded lands of the Darawal-speaking people of the UN Nation here in Wollongong, or the Illawarra. 
Um, and I'm part of a team that works with uh, Lucy and Chris, obviously, on Port Kembla, as you just heard. Um, but what I wanted to talk to you about tonight is uh, a different project, and it's the subject of an Australian Research Council, that's the ARC um, uh, fellowship um, that I started work on in February this year, looking at how households navigate change in what we might call um, post-carbon regional economies. And I'm working here with a colleague, uh, Natasha Larkin, who's just started a PhD with me on, on this, which I'll, I'll talk about towards the end. So post-carbon in the context of Australia um, is a particularly sort of fraught idea. Uh, we are the world's largest uh, net exporter of coal. And I think it doesn't come as much of a surprise that um, we are struggling politically and otherwise with the shift to a more diversified uh, service-oriented economy. Wollongong's workers have experienced um, multiple rounds of deindustrialization. I'm sure you're familiar with many of those over the last 50 years. But as Chris pointed to, industrial and resource-based activities are, are very much a contemporary as well as a historical concern. So these are still industrial and resource-based landscapes. So the mountain that you see off to um, the right there, um, I guess in the Canadian or the European context, we might call it a hill, <laughs> um, is Mount Kira, Jira. And it's the highest point on the escarpment that runs immediately to the west of the city of Wollongong. So Wollongong's actually, or the Illawarra region is quite a linear um, landscape. It's about 80 kilometers south of Sydney, and it's probably about 30 kilometers end to end um, to give you some context. I'm another geographer who doesn't have a map. <laughs> okay. Um, so if you were to stand at the, the top of the hill um, in the previous slide and look down, you'd see a regional city that's grown substantially over the last uh, decade or two. And many of the new buildings, that's probably, do I have a mouse? Many of the new buildings that you might see down here in the, the center there, uh, reflect the kind of shifts that we see globally. So a growth in urban living uh, and a burgeoning service sector. So the top five industries of employment in Illawarra today are health, aged care, higher education, hospitality and retail. So very much, a, you know, points to some of those deindustrializing de narratives um, that we've all um, heard about tonight. But under our feet, if we're actually standing in this position at the top of the hill here, remain substantial metallurg metallurgical coal reserves. Now, metallurgical coal, um, you're probably aware, is used in steel making. It's of a much higher quality than the brown coal that's burned in power stations. And so it has a very different trajectory when we look at that global shift away from coal. So the Illawarra has been linked with coal mining since the late 1800s. And like Chris, I, I nod to Eric's um, great work, Eric Eklund's great work, uh, looking at the Illawarra's history in this way, uh, which really does bring together geography and history. So today, the escarpment remains uh, a very active, though highly politicized site of extraction. Underground mining within the southern coal fields provides the Port Kembla Steelworks, but also the expert, export market with this highly valuable metallurgical coal. However, with global coal capital becoming increasingly mobile, the imperative is clear. Um, like all resource regions, the Illawarra needs to begin planning for a future that will probably look markedly different uh, from what it does today. So in this project, and this will run until 2024, um, I'm trying to go part-time because of COVID, um, households are the entry point in looking at uh, socially just energy transitions. So in the project, we're exploring, starting to explore how partners, predominantly women in this sector and older children understand and prepare for change uh, in, the, in the industry uh, at an everyday sort of household level. So we're interested in how this work might be conceptualized or thought of through uh, an ethics of care, situating these coal workers as relational human agents where the decisions and the values, the emotions about their working lives, those decisions aren't being made in isolation, but rather are negotiated through these familial ties and close social networks. And that of course, 
is in a context where those strong union ties are perhaps not as important or not as, <laughs> they're still important obviously, but not as strong as they once were. So um, this is like the other projects, another one that's just kicking off. And you know that delicious moment where you realize you've got your first interview and you're super excited. <laughs> it's the moment of anticipation. And you can imagine um, our excitement about a month ago, we uh, started to speak to co-workers and this is literally the first interview and I couldn't not um, include this quote because I think it speaks to some of the complexities of a region in transition. So our first interviewee um, towards the end of, of um, our, our discussion and you know that's all caught up in COVID and having to interview people uh, over Zoom, never a, a fun or easy thing to do, especially with minors, said, I classify myself as an environmentalist. We all want to leave this place better off than we found it. You know, I campaigned against housing developments over at Sandon Point, which was a local uh, important Aboriginal site that was um, uh, developed for housing. I've bloody been arrested. I've chained myself up to cars and that to try and stop bulldozers. Uh, so, you know, it was a big debate in my head to get into it, to get into mining to start with. You're ripping a layer of the ground out, but in the end, you have to provide for your family. And he goes on to talk about um, that, that sort of contradiction in someone that um, has these kind of environmental subjectivities very much connected with uh, community subjectivities. So a lot of sort of service in the community, a lot of service to local surf clubs, youth groups, that sort of thing. Uh, but the challenges of, um, you know, an industry that's uh, sort of been in place for a long time, an industry that's available, an industry that enables him to provide for his family. And of course, these aren't, I guess these aren't, these aren't new ideas in mining and these aren't new ideas in the, the sort of history of uh, coal, certainly. But I think what's interesting here is that when you overlay them with these new sort of environmental subjectivities, uh, it becomes sort of a bit more complex. And in a follow-up interview uh, that we did a couple of weeks later with the whole family, so we did a first, we're doing a first round of interviews with workers and then a second round of interviews with their families. Um, there was an interesting discussion between Jared and his daughter um, about her environmental subjectivities. So she spoke up and, and really talked about how her science teacher had been influential uh, that um, in, in her environmental thinking, that dad was, you know, um, she was challenging her dad in the, in the conversation uh, about, you know, his work in the coal industry. So it's very much um, about those, those changing intergenerational uh, justice aspects of climate change that we're packing, unpacking in this project. So really looking forward to, um, to getting stuck into the rest of those interviews. I'll leave it there, thank you. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Chantelle. And, and energy transitions is such a, an important subject uh, within the study of deindustrialization. I know I know within our project, um, Petra Delata's work, uh, I'm not sure if you know Petra, um, but she's at the University of Calgary and she wanted to be here today, but she's right now, I think it's like five, four o'clock in the morning in Calgary. Um, but she she has a group of people there, including a couple of postdocs and, and you uh, will be having a Fulbright chair on energy transitions. And and so she's been working on households within coal miner families in the Ruhr Valley um, in Germany. So I, I can see all kinds of links with what you're doing. And I know even Gibbs in, Austra in, um, in Scotland is also working on energy transitions as his next, next project. So, and so I think what you're doing there is again, I think a topic that's just emerging right across you know, various, parts of, various parts of the world. Um, ne next up we have uh, Jesse Adam Stein who, uh, here, let's take your bio, um, is a senior lecturer and ARC DECRA fellow at the University of Technology, Sydney's School of Design. She is an interdisciplinary design researcher specializing in the relationship between technology, work, and material culture. She has published extensively on skill loss and the human experience of economic restructuring and deindustrialization. And I know she has a book that's coming out pretty soon, right, 
on, on this topic, which I think will be a, a very important contribution to, to the international scholarship. Jesse. Thanks, and um, Lauren, can you please load the slide? Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me okay? I'd also like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from which I'm currently living and working. Um, and it's the same with, with Chris, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I'm in Sydney. Um, and Stephen did encourage me to talk about my new book. So I, I, I fear this will be a shameless plug, but it is an interesting um, thing for me to, it's probably the first time I've actually spoken publicly about it, I think. Um, it's due out at the end of the year. It's published with Palgrave. It's an oral history text um, called Industrial Craft in Australia, um, Oral Histories of Creativity and Survival. And I come from design history, but I often find myself stepping well beyond the traditional bounds of design history, and that's just how it's going to be. Um, it, this book is very much about the what might be seen as lingering vestiges of industrial craft practices, um, but not just practices, also ongoing skills and ongoing knowledge and culture that I argue still exist within not only workplaces, but also domestic life, uh, creative practice and Australian culture more broadly and educational settings. And in this book, I, I really tried to discuss industrial craft labor in a way that sort of moves beyond nostalgic images of the tragic craftsman even though a lot of the people I did end up speaking to are men. Uh, and I, I'd like to sort of move beyond that and look at more complexity to the human experience of deindustrialization and workplace change, including gendered processes of craft and culturation and how that's changed over time. Um, just to clarify what I mean when I'm using the term industrial craft, I'm referring to refined manual skill and specialist production knowledge in manufacturing processes specifically. Um, so this often includes the pre-production stages of manufacturing, but also the hand finishing stages that often occur after machine production. So I'm not so much looking at process workers. I'm looking at people who in Australia, we tend to refer to as tradespeople. So they're people who have completed a trade apprenticeship in the traditional sense. Uh, and then <laughs> apprenticeships important in Australia in the sense that people who have trained in apprenticeships even when they move on to other industries, they still retain their trade identity with them in, in various ways. So toolmakers are, in a sense, always toolmakers, for example. So their background in industrial craft continues to inform how they work, how they live, how they educate other people, and how they create. And I, I talk about, you know, even artistic aspects of this. Um, today in Australia, and probably in a lot of other parts of the global north as well, I argue that Industrial craftspeople are almost invisible. It's, it's generally assumed that they, if they exist anymore, they're, they're only at lost trades fairs or they're in museum demonstrations or they're about to retire. And so there's this real sort of consensus that this is a thing of the past or something that's experiencing some kind of inexorable industrial decline. And I, I know that uh, many people involved in Depot have questioned this, this assumption about the inevitability of the way in which deindustrialization has been framed in mainstream contexts. And I'm not gonna to go too much into that other than to say, I agree that, that there are certain assumptions in that, um, in that framing. One of the things I really emphasize in this book is that, and I agree with, with some of what Chris says as well, that deindustrialization is not a, it's not a finished process. And very, it's very much still with us in many ways. <laughs> there are lots of examples of active industry uh, and the broadening of that. And, and when I'm looking more specifically at industrial craft, when you look for it, you certainly can find it quite quickly. And I think remnants of industrial craft actually can, can potentially show us there's potential for understanding more sustainable and equitable futures of work and production and creating as well um, that go along with that when you look closely. Um, Lauren, can I change to the second slide, please? Thanks. Um, so this book draws upon an oral history project that I conducted over the past ooh, about six years. It took a while because there was some maternity leave in the middle there. Um, and I focused on a very particular trade. It's not a particularly well-known trade. So I'll introduce it. It's engineering pattern making, uh, <laughs> which is a trade that has historically been really closely associated with metal casting and foundries, but also uh, the plastics industry. So in pattern makers make models, molds and patterns that make molds that then produce the final product. So I introduced, uh, I interviewed a group of engineering pattern makers that were currently working 
also retrained and retired. So a, a wide age range. And I actually also, when I embarked upon this project, I didn't realize that I'd be interviewing the smallest continuing industrial trade in Australia. So when you look at the employment statistics, pattern making is the smallest ongoing industrial trade. And I think that's the same in the United States based on the labor stats. So it's still there, but in very, very small numbers. Pattern makers were traditionally high precision woodworkers. So they were seen as the, like the top of all the woodworkers. But since uh, the 1990s and certainly the early 2000s, much of their work has been usurped by CNC machines. So computer numerically controlled machine cutters and also CAD software. Um, but one of the things that's interesting about Australia is that there is often this industrial technological time lag that takes place. So I was able to find pattern shops in Australia, in Sydney and Melbourne, where CNC machines are not used, where pattern makers are still using manual techniques to uh, build industrial patterns. So that was pretty interesting. There's not many of them, but there's a few. Um, I think <laughs> looking a bit more generally, rather than being a book about pattern making, this was very much a book about pattern makers. So I was more interested in the people in the role of class and gender in as a structuring force in their working lives, their creative practices, even things like the role of childcare in their working life and how that changed their decisions, their relationship to technological change and the conflicts that that brought and their experiences of the labour market, how they chose to retrain themselves. And, and often they did this through funding their own retraining processes, not through any government support. Um, I guess I, I don't want to spend too long, but I wanted to just point to some of the other things that the book looks at. I returned to a uh, class based analysis in one section of the book to look at what it means to be conducting oral history interviews with you know, current or ex manufacturing workers, many of whom are particularly angry, disaffected, maybe interested in you know, right wing populist points of view. So what does it mean to be inter interviewing people in, in that context? Um, I also look at um, the artistic practices of engineering pattern makers. So <laughs> what it means when they decide to become artists, what do they bring with them as artists? And I also look closely at the experiences of two women in engineering pattern making um, and look at how their experiences of deindustrialization uh, and technological engagement uh, differ very much from the men. Uh, and I address discrete <clears throat> prospects for niche manufacturing revival. Um, in an Australian context. That's probably all I have time for. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Jesse. Like really, really fascinating work. And I'm always sort of reminded of an interview I did back in 1997 with Basil Adili, who was a core maker in Hamilton, Ontario, who was you know he brought up his tool kit from the basement and he showed me each of the items how they it's all handmade tools then he started describing them and, and his his body started telling the story and i was so happy that i had i had i used video right so i was able to capture capture some of that so i you know hopefully in the question and answer you know, we'll be able to talk also about methodology and oral history and how do we you know how do we get at some of these things and Again, listening to you, I was thinking a bit of like Tim Strangleman's work. He's here uh, today, um, and, and others. Um, uh, Kathy Davidson's book, Closing, in, in the context of North Carolina. Um, um, so, yeah, really, really interesting work. Uh, last uh, but but not least uh, is Eric Eklund. And so um, Eric is a, a labor and social historian and professor of history at Federation University's Gippsland campus in Victoria. I hope I, I, I said, uh, or Gippsland, Gippsland. Uh, he has completed work on regional history, mining history and industrial heritage. He was awarded the New South Wales Premier's Prize for regional and community history for his book, uh, Steel Town. And uh, certainly well known for, for his work in, in Port Campbell. So Eric, please. Thanks so much, Stephen. And um, thanks to uh, Lauren as well for the organizational work. Uh, and great to have everyone here, wherever you are um, around the globe. Um, I just want to acknowledge I'm on Gunai Kurnai country this evening, um, located in West Gippsland, about 
100 kilometres east of Melbourne, so in southeast Australia. Um, I'm going to do something different. My Australian colleagues all have very smart and spick um, presentations. I'm just going to range across uh, some of the different places that I've studied in Australia. And sitting down tonight, I started sort of counting them, and there's, there's quite a few. Um, and I may sort of um, diplomatically avoid Port Kembla because it's already come up a few times, but we can always come back to that. But after having done uh, my PhD thesis on Port Kembla uh, in, on the New South Wales South Coast, uh, and then subsequently published the book, I then uh, went off and started looking at uh, other towns which often had a Port Kembla connection. And I ended up uh, doing a lot of work on um, mining towns. So I'm going to go through sort of four points. Uh, and then uh, the fourth point will be my um, uh, sort of rough attempt to sort of bring some of this together and, and make a bit of meaning around it in terms of our theme uh, this evening of deindustrialization. Uh, the first um, point I'm going to make is just the most recent paper that I've been working on which is for a, a commodity-based history, which uh, Duncan Money from Pretoria, uh, I think he subsequently gone to Utrecht, um, had uh, put together this idea of doing a global history of copper. And so I put my hand up to write the Australian version of that. And that paper tries to tackle the Australian copper industry, mining and smelting and refining over the period sort of 1872 about 1920, and that's a period of um, you know significant first phase globalisation, uh, lots of uh, overseas investment in the Australian mining industry, including in copper, but in base metals more generally, uh, and some uh, on-site Australian-based uh, smelting attempts over this period. There's a couple of world-class uh, copper mines in Australia, and they generate sort of long, uh, long serving towns like Mount Morgan in central Queensland, uh, like uh, the Copper Triangle towns in South Australia, that's Wallaroo, Moonta and Kadena. I've done some work on those. And of course, uh, the best Queenstown, not the Queenstown in New Zealand, but the Queenstown uh, in uh, near the far, near the west coast of Tasmania. Uh, is also another, um, you know, town that persists for, you know, more than 100 years. So these are very rich, world-class uh, copper assets. Uh, but at the same time, uh, that industry has a whole lot of fly-by-night, boom-bust towns which come and go. So I guess studying copper in Australia really made me think about the way in which global patterns of deindustrialization and reindustrialization are highly contingent uh, are highly contingent around um, the obvious things like commodity prices, like uh, demand from the First World War, you know, once the industry sort of pulls itself together uh, and re-establishes itself in Australia uh, based on uh, demand from British Ministry of Defence, you know, there's a, there's a huge boom. And then there's, of course, another bust after the end of the First World War. So a lot of the... Um, the towns themselves are very marginal and come and go. And so there are patterns which I argue are almost exclusively down to local factors. So it makes it very difficult to frame a kind of global history of this when there seems to be such a powerful local context shaping um, the story uh, at, at each and every moment. The other thing that I argued with regard to the copy industry was that the nature of that industry shaped a certain kind of politics in these towns. There were certainly moments of radicalism and uh, sort of outbreaks of, you know, class conflict, particularly through unions or the new Labor Party. But for the most part, because there was such an anxiety over a highly um, contested and variable industry, there was a lot of cross-class coalition. And I've also argued for similar aspects in, in Port Kimbler. So this concern around protecting fixed assets, and that often led to a much more moderate sort of laborist politics. Um, so there are just a few comments about, about copper. And then I'm going to move on to, to Newcastle. Uh, I worked at the University of Newcastle uh, for more than 12 years. 
and uh, Newcastle, New South Wales, that is, um, which is about uh, two hours drive north of Sydney, located on a river port, the Hunter River. And Newcastle was the site of steelmaking in Australia from 1915 through to closure of the BHP Steelworks in 1999. And this seems to be, uh, uh, to my mind, it was an obvious case to, to look at uh, how heritage and how uh, the sort of renderings of the city's past fared post closure of, uh, of steelmaking. Um, the company ran the closure very, very uh, uh, adroitly. They managed it as like a festival, you know, it was more like a commemoration. Um, and there were lots of sort of ritual moments that they very, did very smart PR to, to do it in that way. But what happened in Newcastle uh, in the subsequent two or three years was a massive commodities boom, such that Newcastle then became um, one of the most uh, productive uh, and busiest coaling ports in the world, the construction of, of new coal loaders, just taking that open cut black coal down from the lower and upper Hunter uh, valleys. Uh, so in terms of heritage and in terms of the way in which the city related to its industrial past, in a sense, we had, once again, we had deindustrialization kind of delayed and transfigured into something new. Uh, I argued in a, a piece that I published in The Public Historian, uh, which compared uh, Newcastle, Wollongong and La Trobe Valley heritage. I argued that that moment after 2001 in Newcastle sort of reset the heritage clock. So once again, we, we didn't sort of seamlessly pass into these new moments of, of deindustrialization, which had all the similar tropes about um, under, underlining worker masculinity, about a city lost for identity. Instead, we had a kind of a new industrial phase, which, which was around uh, coal expansion. I was gonna say something um, more, this could be like 0.2 and a half if you like, but I'll add this one in. I also did some work on the uranium mining town of Mary Kathleen, uh, which is uh, in Northwest Australia. If you go to uh, Townsville and drive sort of eight hours west, uh, you'll finally drive past the old entrance to Mary Kathleen, almost to Mount Isa. And Mary Kathleen is another good example of these remarkable political frames that shape the comings and goings of towns because it's very much a Cold War product. Uh, as a uranium mining town, um, it had uh, one main customer and that was the British Ministry of Defence. Uh, and all of the uranium oxide that was milled, mined and milled at Mary Kathleen uh, ended up um, going to, to that one main contractor. Then it was shut reopened again, uh, tried to sell some uh, yellow cake to uh, German, uh, Japanese buyers, uh, but then subsequently was, was closed down again. So that was a purpose-built town, built in the sort of mi middle of the semi-arid zone, um, about 80 kilometres from, from Mount Isa. But again, it's, it's arrival, it's, it's nature and it's disappearance. It kind of disappeared twice, it had two lives is very much uh, about the, the Cold War. Uh, I'll come to my third, um, conscious of the time, I'll come to my third example, which is the Latrobe Valley, which is where I've been living and working for the past 12 years. Um, and the Latrobe Valley is the site of a brown coal mining industry and electricity generation in Victoria. Uh, up until 10 years ago, the Latrobe Valley generated about 85% of Victoria's uh, uh, power needs. So most of the most of the big high voltage lines head um, uh, west of me down towards uh, the metropolis of, of Melbourne. Uh, now that's been in the news, of course, because we're slowly transitioning to renewable energy. Some of the coal uh, mining uh, mining uh, power stations, I should say. Have, have closed and others are due to close in the next few years. But there's also um, not really a, a, an attempt to move into a deindustrialization phase. Again, uh, the state government and others have sort of identified the Latrobe Valley as a site for circular economy or new recycling industry. So the idea that we would just move from, 
from mining brown coal and producing electricity, maybe to some new industrial phase um, is very much the frame. But also it's a very masculine story too. Um, and we did have a textile and light manufacturing industry in uh, the valley, which uh, the state government encouraged after 1945. The idea was that the vast majority of, of work in the, in the mining and power generation industry was for men. And so the state government set up um, various schemes to encourage uh, textiles in the valley. Now, those companies closed in the late 60s and early 1970s. So there's a gendered story here too. Um, in a sense, women's industrial deindustrialization happened in the 60s and 70s. And this was the very time when the Latrobe Valley mining industry and power stations were expanding and there was huge amounts of employment for men uh, during the 70s and the 80s, while we had sort of deindustrialization in other major parts of the West. You know, if you, if you look at, at the Midwest of the United States, this sort of is at a time when the Latrobe Valley is, is growing and thriving and, and consolidating. So what does it all mean? Um, let me try and pull it all together and then I'll throw back to, to Stephen. I'm going to say uh, five points. Firstly, I'm very wary, wary of chronological frames for deindustrialization. It strikes me um, that there are so many factors which um, obviate, modify and alter the sort of global patterns that, you know, I, I'm just wondering to the extent to which, you know, we can sort of identify and, and pin it down. There's, uh, secondly, there's a persistence around fixed capital and fixed assets. Um, you know, I'll put my hand up here and say, you know, once upon a time I read David Harvey and I can remember some of it. Uh, but it seems to make a lot of sense that you have a space and a place which has meaning and significance and becomes a, a point of political mobilisation. And in the copper industry and in the other industries that we talk about here tonight, uh, I believe that some of the patterns of global change have been shaped and altered by, by the politics of, of place. Uh, the, the, second, the second point was that um, I think if we are going to try and define or understand deindustrialization, I guess uh, for me there's um, patterns and experiences around uh, the scale of, of communities themselves and, and uh, resident and worker experiences that strike me as being at the heart of at least a kind of a, a pattern that, that I can see being a little bit more relevant. Uh, I'm not really suggesting that the global economy um, is, is um, insignificant. That would be a kind of a crazy thing to say, but I'm trying to think about the patterns which deflect, shape and alter how those global features play out in place. Um, and I think uh, there's a way in which we can cite the analysis at, at the community level and at the level of worker experience, which can maybe help us understand, nonetheless, understand those global patterns uh, at the same time. So anyway, some, some food for thought for you. I'll, I'll throw it back to you, Stephen. Well, that's a, a great note to to end the well, first of all. <laughs> uh, that's a great note to end the sort of presentation part of the uh, the roundtable. And I think one of the things that we've been thinking a lot about in Depot is you know how do you scale up geographically our analysis without losing you know our anchoring in people's lives, right? And and not you know and not losing sort of working class people in the process. And so how do you how do you work across scale in a way that is still humanistic? Um, and I think that's a huge challenge, right? That we are we are we are we are you know struggling with or or thinking about um, and so on. And I think again, I think you know with your your presentation, Eric, I think we're seeing again a theme about like how we're not talking about a linear, you know, process that, you know, moving from one era to another, but it's a lot of complexity on the ground. And, and, and as you're saying, it's also about reindustrialization in different kinds of contexts. So, so let's op open it up to, to questions. I'm sure there's, there's loads of questions from, from the audience. Um, and so you can, uh, you can uh, sort of uh, put your hand up, um, 
if you're in video, and I'll see you because you're in the first panel of images, uh, or you can uh, put your hand up in the participants thingy, or you can just ask your question in chat. Who wants to start? Tim, we'll go with Tim and then and then Stefan Berger. Um, thanks everyone. Uh, that was a great set of papers and, and I really appreciate people talking at night. Um, as a former shift worker, I, I would have been getting my head down around the same time you're you're speaking. So um, I just wanted to say, um, particularly, um, I had the privilege of um, reading uh, the near final draft of Jesse's book, and it is it's absolutely brilliant. And I think it raises so many questions about the industrialization studies, about that um, the notion of the half life, what happens when we need to focus on workers, skilled workers who are. Um, kind of in the process of being um, eroded or um, marginalized by new technology and the kind of in industrialized countries in a kind of um, a, a, a lack of care um, by politicians maybe of, of um, industrial work and industrial workers and the skills that they had. And, and what's interesting about Jesse, uh, Jesse's book is just how um, small this group was to begin with uh, and yet they're they're really teetering on the brink of uh, of of loss and once you lose those skills it's not simply the workers with their embedded knowledge it's the trainers and the um the kind of educational infrastructure that's going to collapse or implode um that i don't know what jesse would say about this but um that would almost be impossible um, to reconstitute in those um, in those places again. So um, I, I just wanted to say it's, it's a real plug for Jesse's book because it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, and this is before I saw the photo. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, and I really appreciate that that you read the book too, as well as Stephen. Um, in response to the question about you know what would happen if if this trade engineering pattern making completely disappears, it. Um, it's a real risk. I mean, we're, we're looking at numbers in Australia and I don't have 2020, 21 census numbers yet, but the 2016 numbers were very, very small. And then talking to pattern makers anecdotally, there's probably only about 150 trained pattern makers across Australia and many of them work part time. But when you speak to foundries, and this is the crazy thing, when you speak to steel foundries, they say, we really want these skilled workers. We really want to find them. Um, they can't get them from overseas at the moment. There's not that many of them overseas either. So they, if the foundries make a little bit of political noise, not a lot, but they make a little bit of noise saying, no, we actually need this training happening. And in fact, as a result of, of some of that advocacy, and I don't know whether it was any noise I made, I doubt it was anything to do with me, but certainly it's a result of foundries making a bit of political noise in Victoria. They restarted apprenticeships in Victoria in engineering pattern making a couple of years ago. So <laughs> sort of once you start getting steel foundries saying, no, these are skilled workers we need, we can't actually do what we need to do without them, then sometimes you get a little tiny bit of action to address that. I don't believe that the apprenticeship form as it is now and this vastly underfunded TAFE model, that's the vocational training system in Australia, is shockingly underfunded. So at the moment, the training that they're, that the younger pattern makers, apprentice pattern makers are getting, it's not, not very good quality training, um, but it's better than nothing, I suppose, yeah. Next up we have uh, Stefan Berger and then Ian Stewart and then Angela Parsons. So, Stefan. Thanks, Stephen, and hi, everyone. Um, it's been great uh, to be with you. Thanks very much for um, all these uh, insights uh, into what is going on in Australia. It's been certainly a very pleasurable uh, early afternoon here in Germany listening to all of you. Um, my, my question, which I guess is, is to all of you, uh, is one I guess that is also central to the depot project, which, you know, the full title, uh, The Industrialization and the Politics of Our Time, uh, whether you could say a little bit more about um, the politics behind uh, those various phenomena of uh, deindustrialization and reindustrialization, because Australia has always struck me as a particularly interesting case, given that it was such an early laboratory 
of uh, a labor, a, a sort of fairly reformist uh, labor uh, politics um, in the world. Uh, you have that wonderful memorial to the eight hour day in Melbourne, uh, just in front of the trades hall, and you have that long tradition uh, of a laborist politics. Um, and yet you also, of course, moving closer to the present, uh, have a kind of um, a strong impact of a form of neoliberalism that we've seen thrive in many Anglo-Saxon uh, contexts uh, since the 1990s. Um, so I wonder with all your, you know, with, with all recognition, what, what Eric also talked about, I think the, the importance of um, local factors, the importance of uh, the politics of place, um, how would you see, uh, especially in a kind of comparative perspective, uh, the role of politics uh, in Australia in relation to these processes of deindustrialization? Thank you. So who from the panel wants to respond first? Like Eric, your 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 mic's on, so I'll assume that you want to go first. So, <laughs> I've got a little um, sneaky um, mute here on my microphone, so it it yes, it, it um, makes me look fully engaged. Um, I was kind of sighing because it's such a difficult question from Stefan, um, and uh, I I feel that that uh, at least the the regions that I've been studying. Uh, in the last 20 years, it's very much the triumph of neoliberalism. Um, the, of course, one of the, the, um, the drawbacks of, of the kind of lens by which you, you enter uh, these themes through place, which has you know, pretty much been my thing since I first came up, you know, historians, researchers, we have one good idea and then we articulate it through the rest of our career. Um, but, I, but, you know, one of the... One of the um, the drawbacks of that is that those kind of national patterns and national institutions we can we can overlook. Um, I think uh, COVID has really shown us uh, the extent to which uh, the federal structures are, are absolutely central to the Australian experience. And you know, it's I find it hard to believe that that you know I, I can't um, jump in the car and drive to Queensland, um, much less drive to Port Kembla uh, across the Victorian border. Um, and then very much our, our lives are being framed by public health orders at state level. So there is that factor, but there are other uh, uh, institutions which are, are, are crumbling under neoliberalism, uh, particularly the centralized wage fixing, uh, the ways in which you know, there's no um, secondary bargaining uh, you know, outlawed from, from the, the mid seventies under the, the Fraser government. You know, all of these kind of things, I think, really do shape the political economy uh, that underpins the politics that tries to articulate um, a critique of these changes. Um, I don't really see uh, a strong uh, politics which uh, argues for industry policy, uh, which argues for just transition. Uh, I don't see a politics which is um, understanding the way in which our industries are changing and trying to represent the concerns of working people. I, I see a politics uh, disconnected from place, uh, disconnected from workplaces uh, and caught up in a kind of a, almost a floating rhetorical space of, twi of Twitter. Um, so uh, I don't see much in the way of a grounded class politics or a laborist politics. Um, anymore so yeah maybe others will have a bit more optimism uh, lucy lucy so stefan uh it has eric said it's a really um difficult question but I, I want to just put it into historical context and say the neoliberalism that you're talking about has so many similarities with the liberalism of the late 19th century and the conditions that the workers that were, you know, the, the, that we were discussing around what's happening these days is precisely what the workers that we're looking at in the late 19th and early 20th century were living through. The precarity uh, was, a, you know, a terrible um, bane on their existence. Um, poverty, etc. 
Um, and I think we need to ha actually look at what, what's happening now um, in that context as well. I think as we sort of number of people have talked about deindustrialization as an, a, a one-time thing, it's part of a long process. Of, and um, I think, you know, in terms of the politics, not big P, but local uh, politics, if we look at the example that um, the, the shale mining project, what's really interesting about the conflicts uh, between or competition between the different industries is that actually they're owned by the same people um, and they're making profits. You know, the, the, the people, Anne could tell us a little bit more, we're just starting to look at this, but the the mine owners are at the forefront of the sort of tourism of the middle classes going to these, you know, sublime areas and so on. So the, it's the concentration of wealth is kind of what I'm talking about here and how that is predicated on these precarious um, conditions for the workers. Um, and really, you know, there's so many similarities in terms of, you know, the gig workers and, and these itinerant miners, you know, moving from place to place because nothing is stable. Um, so that, that's just my, my gut reaction to your, your question. Mm. Reminds me of Jefferson Cowie's idea of the great exception that, that what we're experiencing now <laughs> has been experienced before. Um, massively. Um, Ian Stewart, maybe you can, you can ask your next question. Um, well, <clears throat> thanks. Look, my, my background is, is less history and more um, industrial archaeology and heritage. Um, but one of the interesting things I've noticed with, with um, the colleagues I work with who are mostly come from the, the sort of British um, uh, tradition of trouble in the mill type industrial heritage people is that they have a very strong view of industrialization, which is steel works, coal mines, flour mills. And I, I, I really wonder whether, in fact, when they talk about deindustrialization, what's actually really happening is that the industry is still there and that the, the economy is still there. They're just, they're just transformed to something else. And one thing that comes to mind is, is biotech. Um, you know, it's not something that you could in a sense, preserve uh, in the way that they've, say, preserved Ironbridge, but yet it has as much imp input into um, uh, the world and the economy and people are moving from the sort of standard sort of industries into ind an industrial context, but it's not recognised as industrial heritage. Mm -hmm. So, or indust industrial. So um, I'm just throwing this out to everybody to mm -hmm. see what they think. Maybe uh, Tanya might might wait in here, thinking about um, like heritage, um, like what's it comes back to sort of erasure or notions of like centrality, maybe. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't think I can answer that question. But am I allowed to follow up on the last one? Just sure. Yeah, just, just jump in. Yeah, yeah. Just as as a as a public historian, I think the kind of the polit making people aware of the politics that frames their everyday lives is absolutely central to our project and. You know that the politics that structures their landscapes, their lives, their their households, um, the industries that they they move between every day, and I think that for us is central to the work we're doing, making them much more aware of that politics of settler colonialism that you talked about, of class, race, and gender that many of them have no inkling of, and I think um, for, that's what drives us. And I'm afraid if we had the archaeologists with us, they might be able to answer your question, Ian, but I feel woefully inadequate doing so, I'm afraid. Sorry about that. Does anyone else want to try to sort of respond a bit to, to Ian? Um, yeah, Chris, please. Yeah, thank you, Ian. I mean, I can, as the geographer in the room, I guess I could talk about this particular place. And um, it's true that there's a couple of interesting things going on here, I think. One is that we're seeing diversification in what we might call the industrial base happen and a lot of blurring of the boundaries, to be honest. So, I mean, I think Jesse's work and some of the stuff we've done too is really contesting the idea that, um, you know, industrial work is somehow bereft of creativity, for example, whereas in the, from the 1990s onwards, we had the rise of all this discourse around the creative economy. And in places like Port Kembla, amongst others, it was often seen as a sort of replacement 
uh, for industry. But in actual fact, there's all kinds of these sort of fine grained connections between sectors now. And often they're at really small scale, which is exactly what Jesse's, Jesse's work is showing. So there's something like 80% of all manufacturing workers in Australia work in enterprises with fewer than 10 employees. Um, so the vast bulk of what might be considered manufacturing in Australia is all kinds of diverse things all over the place, some of which might actually have connections to, yeah, like you say, the, the steel and flour mills and the traditional picture of what we call industry, but an awful lot of it um, is, is making all kinds of connections, whether it's to biotech or, uh, you know, furniture design and a lot of the, uh, the older trades too being um, um, recast in different ways with connections to more contemporary renderings of those industries. The other thing I wanted to just say is more around the politics of that is that often that fine grained analysis is missing when we think about the big policy reports. When we think about if there is an industry policy in Australia and what the manufacturing policy debates are, if there are any, and there's really a kind of absence of significant industry policy in Australia, really, um, it tends to go towards certain things, it tends to go towards uh, big picture opportunities for ministers to cut ribbons in front of large scale infrastructure, for example, that can be touted and that can attract private investment. Um, or it tends to be high tech. It tends to be always around, you know, the new opportunities for the manufacturing sector and advanced manufacturing, for example. Um, so again, it's this question of what's visible, what's invisible, what's, what's a presence in the policy landscape and what's forgotten, if you like. Mm. And often it is, it's the small scale stuff, um, the diversifying stuff that um, is often really missing from that debate. And there's a political, I think there's a real political element to that. Uh, next up is Angela, and then after Angela, Hillary. Hi, everyone, um, and thanks, thanks for your talks. A uh, few of you have mentioned the gendered nature, I'm sorry, the gendered nature of the work, um, especially male dominated industries. And um, as someone who's uh, researching for my Emrose Sydney Warfies, I'm just wondering how you approach that um, and how you deal with that um, heavy skewing of gender. Do you wanna direct that to a person on the panel or just them all? Well, a few of you mentioned it. <laughs> I don't <laughs> have it um, to anyone, anyone who wants to. Yeah, I'm happy well, to speak to it, but I'm sure <laughs> Chantel would. Maybe, maybe we'll start with Chantel and then we'll, we'll yeah, go to Jesse. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for, for dumping me in that one. Um, <laughs> and Jesse, Jesse and I have had many, many conversations about um, what it is to, to be a woman, um, you know, researching, you know, these, these spaces. Um, my experience is flavoured by. Um, my PhD, which was, you know, on um, my own experiences of training and working at Port Kembla as an industrial electrician 25 years ago. So um, 25, gosh. Um, yeah, so so um, I think how to talk about gender. What, Angela, just to go back to sort of the, the angle that you're coming from in your, in your question there, can I ask you to elaborate a bit more? Sure. Um, I guess because these industries are predominantly male, um, I'm just wondering, I mean, sorry, I've forgotten um, her name. Um, who's your, oh, Jessie. Um, yeah. So Jessie, I think, or I um, might be getting confused, but so, somebody else was talking about um, the home, the home life as well. But um, if you're not including the home life, I'm just wondering if it's a becomes an, a difficult a, a difficult area, or if it's an issue that you are not including um, women. Yeah, I think it's really interesting in especially male dominated industries, mining, steel. I think pattern making. Jesse probably. Um, lends itself to that to to I think for for a long time or in general we've tended to to sort of look at workers in isolation or there's a tendency to look at workers in the workplace um, and I think part of what gave rise to my interest in the family as as a site is that you know I certainly know in my relationship we discuss work decisions all the time um, each other's work decisions all the time and so that became 
um, my way into sort of a broader framing of um, the household as a place where those, those decisions and those subjectivities, those um, kind of uh, positions on work are, um, are created and discussed. So I think, you know, we can't talk about workers in a very disembodied way and we also can't talk about them as, you know, these floating heads on sticks that are interchangeable in workplaces without the, the many people and, and all the networks that surround them, I think. So, yeah, I think that really does, no matter what the industry, if we can broaden out, you know, how we look at workers um, to include the household, to include children, that sort of thing, I think that's a first step perhaps towards... No, that's um, great. Um, that makes a lot of sense. And as you say, not rather than thinking of them just as workers, but uh, maybe their, you know, interpersonal relationships... Um, with others, yeah, that, that, that yeah. Time, not just, and just workers. Say, yeah. And um, Tanya should s- sort of say something about family, but I just want to say also that even in male dominated uh, industries, there are a lot of women uh, doing lots of work and they're, they're de centered. Um, and uh, I think that that's a real problem. So, you know, all the work I did on the railways, I was all, you know, masculine work site, et cetera. But there were women, you know, doing upholstery, doing cleaning, doing typing in, from the 20s, you know, and so on and so forth. They're just, you need to dig for them. And I just uh, add another uh, point, which is there's gender and then there's women. And um, one of the things that I found when I stumbled across the women munitions workers in the railways during a very short period, they were both in doing masculine work, but peripheral, right? They were in, you know, put up hidden away from the men. So there's this this locational uh, dichotomy as well, where they're located in the workplace and then there's the other side of it, of course, which um, Chantal was talking about and, and Tanya is the expert on, which is the family connections. And um, one of the things that I found really amazing when we were down in the, in, the, um, in the valleys with the archaeologists and they were finding things and we found a broken plate from one of the hotels and the archaeologist said, oh, one of the workers must have stolen it. And I went, you know, having done <laughs> research on women, I said, but, you know, how do you know that maybe one of the wives was working in the hotel or made that, that you know, et cetera, et cetera. The, we're constantly making assumptions about the relationships and the family division of labour. Um, so that's it. So, like, that's all I've got. Can I pitch in here as uh, one of the archaeologists? I've sure. just been go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Susan. Yeah. The background, but I just thought we didn't say it was stolen. We thought that maybe it was taken on a special happy <laughs> occasion, <laughs> and that they wanted to have some memorial kind of of like. But I was thinking of of a family, and that's actually what I wanted to put in here was just that when we first went down there, thinking of mining camps your brain, my brain, even I'm a woman, but was thinking men's camps. And then you start finding these pretty dishes and you start finding a perfume bottle and you realize, no, no, these were families down here and we've got ink bottles, you know? So who's writing? Were kids learning how to write? You know, there's all sorts of things going on down there that you don't expect until you find those bits and pieces of evidence, which is why I love this because we're getting all of these different aspects to come together and complement each other uh, with the archival evidence and the interviews and the archeological evidence. Um, But yes, indeed, I find that really fascinating that these camps definitely had women for sure. I mean, these were families, couples, you know, maybe some families, but these are the kinds of things to put into that picture, which hadn't been there before. So Mm -hmm. just my little uh, archaeological input there. Yeah, no, that's great. And I I think one of the, um, 
before we go to Hillary, um, like one of the things I, I've been thinking a lot about is how like, you know, the gender division of labor or the sex typing of, of work within workplaces. So coming back to I get Lucy's idea that you have men and women in the same workplaces, but women are sort of like um, ghettoized in certain sort of say production lines or certain occupations. So when you start seeing decline of industry, um, women don't even have the same mobility with implants, right? Like because of the job categorization or because of of union um, uh, seniority rights and how how unions were sub subdivided, right? And so women couldn't necessarily, you know, move from this occupation to that. And so I, I find that, you know, they disproportionately get impacted, you know, by 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 sort of restructuring or downsizing even before closure, for example. So I think I think this is really central to to, to the wider conversations. Hillary, you're next. Yeah. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm also, I come from an archaeological background. Hi, everybody. It's really nice to be here. And um, I'm going to interrupt the flow now. So I just want to go back to Ian's point about um, industrial heritage and archaeology in the UK, which is where I'm based. And, and I think it's really interesting and, and, and worthwhile point to make, Ian. And I completely agree with you about the continuing emphasis in industrial heritage, particularly on the, the traditional industries of the the 19th and 20th century. But I think this is partly about, and I think it's important to actually look at the history of, of industrial archaeology and industrial heritage, which of course for our differences between the two, um, and particularly our relationship to the Industrial Revolution. Because if I look at the Japanese context, they don't have, to my mind, the same kind of romanticism um, around industry, their, their concepts and the questions around industry are, are, seem to me, from what I hear from my Japanese uh, friends, are, are more to do with environmental degradation and pollution. So the legacy of, of our relationship with the Industrial Revolution is that we're still, if you look at the, the way that the, the national government agencies are operating, and also if you look very closely at the national and regional research frameworks, and there's still this great emphasis on the, the remains of the Industrial Revolution and the problems around grappling with things like integrated steelworks, if you want to have any kind of steel heritage presence, uh, are clearly shown there. So, um, yeah, I, I'm aware of work in geography, but, but looking at things like call centres and those other kinds of industrial work. And the other person um, I'd just like to flag up really quickly is um, there's a really interesting paper um, uh, by Sephirin Penrose, who's a contemporary archaeologist, and she was looking at the car industry, but she was tracking forwards um, in Oxford the, the transformations from the um, from the, the city, the town, the city plant, the car plant, and then what came after in terms of these fitness gyms that were new, that were then established in these. Um, um, new kind of industrial stroke business parks and she was making the comparison between the body on the industrial production line and then the body in these fitness gyms so there are people that are looking at you know those kinds of um, transformations and I hesitate to say the word post-industrial because that's a separate argument about whether that actually exists or not but I'll just stop there and say yeah thank you for your comment and I agree with you So does anyone else have, have a have a question for for the panelists or the panelists themselves at, at, you know if there's a comment or a reflection um can i ask jesse a question um do any of your pattern makers engage in computer-aided drawing and you know and can you comment about that use of new technology in terms of old crafts kind of thing sure yeah it's a major um, tension between a lot of these pattern makers and some of them see some as betraying the trade because they retrained in cad and learned how to use cnc machines or bought a cnc machine for their pattern shop and others see it as inevitable and just what they had to do to survive in work and then there'll be another group that just left pattern making entirely because they couldn't face working with the new technologies. They didn't want to do that at all. They had to leave. And so I talk, it's a major theme in the book, but it's particularly in one chapter, I talk about that, that tension between those who stay 
and retrain and those who leave because they don't want to face the new tech. Yeah, there is certainly a group of pattern makers who have basically become um, CAD specialists, CAD technicians. That's what they do now. They say the toolkit's changed. I have computers, have a big CNC machine. I hope it'll last me another 15 years because I don't want to spend another 100 grand on another one. <laughs> this is massive. That's the other thing. It's a huge outlay of money. You know, uh, I think about parallels to the printing industry when that changed over to computerized uh, typesetting, et cetera. And for, for compositors to retrain, they just had to buy a keyboard. So they learned the QWERTY keyboard so they could use computers. But for, for this group of <laughs> workers, you know, you basically you have to have access to really, really expensive technology. And that closes a lot of people out unless they're part of a, a bigger business. Well, I guess I, I, you know, one question I, I would have maybe for each of you is, um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, here we're, we're sort of thinking about Australia and and sort of industrial decline. So what, what do you think, you know, what, what does the Australian example offer, you know, the rest of us who might not be studying Australia, right, but are you know, are, are studying deindustrialization. So how, you know, what, what, what's the, what, what's sort of the, you know, how, how do you see it fitting, right, within uh, a global sort of conversation? Um, and if you had like one thing, and I, I want to get back to seller colonialism too. <laughs> like the, to me, this is, uh, you know, really, you know, we, we think a lot about like class and race in, in the field and, you think of Trumpism and all this and how and how these are often discussed separately and how how difficult it is to actually talk about them together. But seller colonialism is a whole different thing in a way. It's a whole other layer of the issue. And so I, I love to hear from each of you, maybe to wrap things up about, um, you know, what, what's the intervention here, maybe? Yeah. So maybe we can go in the order, of, you know, of the panelists. So starting with, um, I think Tanya was first, right? So. Oh, look, I would say that the, the value of comparison is really important here. So, you know, my last project did a comparison of family history in Britain, Australia and Canada. And it was really important to me to draw those um, parallels and distinctions, distinctions between those settler colonial communities in terms of the structure of the family and the passion for family history, history and the popularity of family history. And in this project, we're bringing that together. Um, and absolutely driving home the importance, I guess what we've just been talking about, of making clear that you can't separate family from working life, right? You can't, you know, our societies have taught us to narrativize our working lives quite differently from our personal lives. And our project is, is really making clear that you can't do that and you shouldn't do that. Um, and if you do, then you don't make clear the profound politics that structure both of those environments or all of those environments. I'll leave it there. That's awesome. <laughs> um, Lucy. Um, I, I won't, I, I, I've been talking too much. So I, I just want to say that in terms of the settler uh, and the colonial angle um, and the metropolis, men in the UK, I think what we need to keep in mind of is the context of the, the mobility, the mobility of the capital that shaped the industry, the mobility of the people who worked in those industries and, and, the, and the parallels uh, in terms of the industry, the industries themselves, as well as the circle, the circuits in which they operate you know, taking the, the point that um, Eric made about it's it's not linear. Um, it's, it's like my argument about the deindustrialization and the railways that it, it hasn't. It's it's an ongoing industry. It goes through ups and downs and so on. Um, and I think that's the case with many. Um, so it's the continuities we need to look at as much as the discontinuities. Chris. Uh, yeah, look, I'd agree with Lucy on that. Absolutely. I mean, the, the question itself, in some ways, touches a raw nerve for geographers who, particularly from this part of the world, who object to having to show how something distinct from this part of the world then contributes back to a global north oh. where theories are universalized, as it were, and 
I think actually it's more a case of really highlighting that that there are real limits to the um, that all knowledge is in place, right? So those deindustrializing discourses um, that we may be contributing to from or critiquing from this part of the world have themselves come from places that are similarly um, the product of all of these sort of interwoven forces and the combination of global flows and local experience. So I think it's probably more about an agenda to cosmopolitanize those discourses, whether it's urbanism, deindustrialization, and those sorts of things. And from this part of the world to do that and to do it properly requires being attentive to all of the things that both Tanya and Lucy have already said, and particularly the settler colonial experience is, is really true. Um, I mean, the other thing that I think cuts across just in this particular kind of grouping that's really interesting, I think Eric's talk in particular connects to that, is the way in which we think about materials, commodities, and place. It isn't just about singular places either. It's about these connections, right? So you know, Port Kembla is a, a place that has its own politics and its own history, Aboriginal history and industrial history, but it's equally bound up in the wheat fields of the central west of New South Wales that now supply it with grain. And it's one of the largest export grain hubs in Australia. And connected to that is the coal that's coming from other places as well. And so all of these are places are bound up in ongoing capitalist and colonial projects to, um, you know, to extract value from this place in different sorts of ways. So they seem to me to be more, um, I don't know if it's as much about something distinctively Australian that contributes to the global debate as more evidence that we need to have that more um, cosmopolitan, I suppose, for want of a better word, um, approach to it. Well, I'm, I'm Canadian. No one studies Canada. <laughs> from outside of, of Canada and and um, um, I guess like my question was more like uh, aligned to like um, you, know, uh, you, you know to me there's value of studying Canada because it, it speaks to a wider wider conversation right that there's value you know that we can learn you know that it, it contributes to to things so like today we've been hearing a lot about commodities for example that's something that we haven't heard so much in other other sessions that's right. So was it, was it, yeah. Wasn't it sort of premised on like, you know, Canada's <laughs> <laughs> the center of the universe <laughs> kind uh, of thing. Um, but I, I, I take your point. Um, but I, I, I do think that we need to, you know, you know, speak at multiple sort of uh, registers, right? That sort of place-based work that we all believe in, right? And, and engage with, but also national conversations that we have, right? But also, um, you know, you know, transnational, I guess, where people are trying to 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 find connection and so on. Um, next up is Chantel. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I'm going to note before I say anything that it's getting very late here, and I'm getting my mind is getting very garbled. But um, look, I. I I think something that, that I'm looking forward to unpacking on the Port Kembla project with Chris and Amelia, who's also in the audience here, is, um, is the, the contemporary nature of settler colonialism, the ongoingness of it, um, and the, the role of the industrial project and you know, capital in that. It was only on a recent tour with Chris and Lucy and others through Port Kembla that I sat on the bus, you know, it was a landscape that I worked in myself, but sat on the bus and we went past the big iron ore piles, you know, big piles of country from the other side of the country called Australia. That it, you know, it really hits that these are these are big piles of somewhere else and big piles of, of sentience somewhere else. Um, so I think, you know, the the ongoingness of settler colonialism and how to read that in a material sense, um, I think is is where there's some potential for Australia to contribute here, I think, mm -hmm. in exciting ways. Yeah, Jesse. Um, I think I, I mentioned before that I think the Australian example is quite interesting in terms of um, apprenticeship as an ongoing process. And I know it's come from the United Kingdom model, but it has its own unique strangeness to it now. And also this, and I referred to it before, this sort of in some industries, this technological time lag, the fact that that especially with smaller businesses, smaller markets, you often have businesses that are, you know, using older technologies and older skills uh, 
rather than the newer ones available simply because that's the only thing that you can do to get by. So that you, you end up getting these nice little time capsules almost. Um, and probably being a bit more glib here, but <laughs> I guess I, I'm feeling so demoralised right now about the Australian political sphere that I feel like maybe Australia might end up being the global backwater, the, the global example of just how to do everything terribly from climate to COVID to tertiary education to race and gender. Like they managed to stuff everything. I did that without swearing. That was great. I'm going to put myself <laughs> on mute now. Thank you. So Eric, uh... You're going to end us with an optimistic note here, are you? Yeah, we, we do Zoom meetings very well, Jesse. So there, there we go. Um, uh, I think that in, industrialization uh, speaks to the heart of the anxiety around uh, justifying dispossession. You know, that, that when a new town is formed in regional remote Australia, all the local civic worthies, the, the mayors, the, the industrialists, the um, uh, newspaper editors, they, they love this because it represents uh, progress and it represents uh, effective acquisition and control of territory. So for me, industrial development, particularly in remote and regional Australia, is uh, uh, an assertion of white sovereignty and control. And, and likewise, I think at the heart of industrial policy in Australia today, is this notion that, oh, we're losing sovereignty, oh, we, you know, we're losing independence. And, and in many ways, um, what lies unacknowledged at the heart of that is the reality of dispossession and, you know, the, the spectre of ghost towns and deindustrialising regions uh, is, uh, in the 1920s, was very clearly about, oh, we can't justify dispossession. And, and I think that issue still lies very much at the heart of our current sort of conundrum. Well, a round of applause for the for the panelists. We had we had uh, six excellent, excellent presentations. And, and I look forward to um, to following the work that's going on in Australia, the two big projects, you know, the other projects, you know, upcoming book coming out. Um, like it's very, you know, it's a very exciting field. The fact that we can actually have a full panel, you know, really on Australia. Um, speaks to you know perhaps the centrality of uh, the concept in the field or pe what people are chewing on there uh the next panel is on gender but i think the one after that is on sort of um sort of north thinking about sort of the global south and 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 sort of expanding our our, our conversation to uh africa to uh, south america to uh the pacific rim other parts of the pacific rim um uh, i think this again will 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 sort of hopefully open up new connections and, and conversations right for 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 the you know for the field so thank you all uh i'm gonna go maybe back to sleep or have breakfast and i gotta decide which <laughs> which way to go um but but thank you all and uh and really appreciate it um, so all the best and, and stay, stay healthy and everything. So. Thanks, David. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. -bye.